Good afternoon, everyone. This has been a very, very day, and we are very glad to have you join us this afternoon uh, in spite of that and in terms of addressing this very, very important topic that is before us in terms of talking about fast action climate mitigation the whole role of short-lived climate pollutants, and we're going to hear a lot more about that from an, uh, an unbelievable, uh, exciting panel of experts this afternoon. To kick off our briefing, though, I want to start by recognizing somebody who has been a real leader on this issue in the United States Senate, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. We are so delighted that he is able to hear that he's able to be here with us uh, at least for a short while this afternoon to kick off this briefing before we turn to Mr. Ockensteiner. Senator Murphy. Well, I would uh, say that it is wonderful to be here with you today, except for the fact that the reason that I was originally scheduled to be otherwise engaged was that uh, today is the day that I preside over the Senate floor, and so normally I would be uh, in the uh, presiding chair today, but because of the events at the Navy Yard, the Senate has uh, adjourned for the day, and so uh, as was mentioned, all of our thoughts and prayers are uh, across uh, the city. Uh, we hope for um, as much good news to come out of a day filled with bad news as possible. Um, I am though thrilled that you're here today to hear from a very distinguished panel, and my role here is just to get out of the way as quickly as possible so that you can hear from the true experts, um, except to say that uh, I think that there is enormous room uh, to build upon some very positive announcements at the international level with some real action here in Washington. Clearly, we are an overall stalemate when it comes to big, bold action on the issue of climate. Um, but the issue that you're going to talk about today, uh, the issue of short-lived climate pollutants, I think gives us some ability uh, to have some action that may avoid some of the particularly thorny political problems that surround trying to mitigate the contribution of carbon dioxide. Uh, these other uh, non-CO2 forms of climate pollutants, whether we're talking about uh, methane or HFCs or black carbon, they certainly present political problems, but none that rise to the level of CO2. Uh, and so right now, uh, our office, along with Senator Menendez and Senator Frank, and we hope one or two Republican offices are trying to put together the initial stages of draft legislation that will at the very least try to lend some support from the United States Senate and House of Representatives to the uh, initiatives of the U.S. State Department and the United Nations and potentially start to accelerate some efforts that the Obama administration has already begun here at home for the United States to lead the way when it comes to some of these most insidious um, greenhouse uh, pollutants. Now, I'll give you one quick example. Um, we know that uh, one of the primary uh, short-lived climate pollutants is the methane that escapes from the oil and gas production that happens in the United States and around the world. And we frankly know that there's a lot more that the industry can do to try to stop that leakage from occurring. It frankly is in their best interest to do so because they keep more of the gas for themselves and for their customers and for their bottom line. And of course, it's in the interests of our efforts. Uh, we here in the United States have begun to aggressively work with the industry, uh, both with respect to new standards being proffered by the administration, but also with respect to new voluntary efforts. And uh, our work shouldn't stop there. Uh, once we start to set new standards here in the United States, we should do everything possible, both on a voluntary basis and based on international negotiations to make sure that those efforts become the standard industry-wide around the globe. And if you put together those efforts with so many others that are happening, um, whether it be in the oil and gas industry, in the landfill industry, in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry, um, we can make some pretty significant progress. And we have to. Because even if you are an optimist about global climate talks, even if you believe that we can get an agreement in 2015 that will be operative on 2020, the damage that is done 
to the overall environment and atmosphere just in the intervening eight years um, is unacceptable. And so some short-term agreements with the United States taking the lead with the UN on short-lived climate pollutants can put a real dent in the pace of global warming, up to a half a degree Celsius, and some reports are saying, um, before we even really get to an overall framework that we hope the United States will be part of as well. So uh, we hope to have good news um, on the legislative front in the coming weeks. As I mentioned, Senator Menendez, uh, Frank, and, and myself, as well as we hope others joining our effort, will be introducing uh, legislation in the Senate to take on this issue of uh, providing congressional leadership on the issue of short-lived climate pollution. Um, I'm going to stick around to hear uh, some of the wonderful presentations today, but by the fact that we have a standing room uh, only crowd here on a very busy day in Washington, um, it tells us that uh, the progress that we have made, the progress that we continue to make is only the beginning. Thank you very much for having me here today. Well, we are simply honored and delighted that you are here and hope that you can stay as, as long as possible to be part of this. And if there are questions that you have that you want to raise uh, while you're here, please do interject them. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute is delighted to be partnering with regard to this briefing with the UN Environment Program. And we are especially honored to have with us today Aachen Steiner, who is the United Nations Undersecretary General and the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, which is playing such an important role with regard to the topic before us today. And a couple things that I just wanted to mention briefly with regard to Achim Steiner, uh, who will uh, come to the podium in, in uh, just a, a minute. In, and I also want to say that he is under a very, very busy schedule. We're just delighted that he is able to be here while he is in Washington. Uh, but he has to leave uh, right around 3.30. And so we want to uh, make sure that he has time to, to present to us, to talk to us about this issue, and perhaps take a couple of questions. But, I think that it is very telling about the kind of gifts that this man brings to the issue when he was nominated by Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2006 to become the executive director of UNEP for a four-year term. He was unanimously elected. He was then re-elected for another four-year term in 2010. And I have to say, to be unanimously elected to anything, and particularly something in terms of a UN agency, I say our hat should go off to this man. So uh, he is a, in a very, very important place at a very, very important time in our planet's history. He brings a lot of experience. He knows Washington well. He'd been formerly the Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. He also served as Secretary General of the World Commission on Dams. He has worked in many different countries. He's worked with government, uh, non-governmental, and international organizations. And he's worked at grassroots level as well as at the highest level of international policy making all of which really equips him well for this very, very important job that he has now, and in terms of the kind of leadership that, that we all need um, in terms of dealing with these terribly important issues for our planet. Uh, Mr. Steiner is both a German and a Brazilian national. He was educated both in the United States at Harvard, also in the UK, as well as in Germany. So he truly is a citizen of the world. Okay. It's almost tempting to continue listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Always makes my life song. <laughs> well, Carol, thank you. Thank you so much for this most generous introduction. Uh, so, thank you so much for finding time, even if the occasion is one that actually um, we were all sorry to hear about the events this morning. but. I'm delighted that you could be here because to be in a room here in Washington full of congressional staffers and with my distinguished panel of, of experts here on an issue that 10 years ago 
probably just a few people on this planet even realize what its significance would be, tells a story in itself. It's the story of science guiding human awareness, um, reflection, recognizing opportunities to act, and taking action. It is only 18 months ago when we met at the State Department with the seven launch partners of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which became the vehicle through which the research on short-lived climate pollutants had begun to hit the radar screens of policymakers. It was under Secretary of State Clinton that uh, a number of countries from North and South have come together to launch this coalition. With a lot of input from NGOs, from scientists, uh, amongst them I want to particularly highlight um, David Zelka, who has played an untiring role in trying to bridge science policy, the Washington Arena also, which was so critical, because when the U.S. takes a proactive interest in an issue, the rest of the world pays attention. It doesn't always mean that agreements immediately emerge, and we are seeing that right now around the issue of um, HFCs and the Montreal Protocol, but the moment that the United States takes an interest in an issue, the rest of the world begins to take an interest in the issue as well. And that is always a precondition for actually making progress. Indeed, I myself saw this happen just a few years ago on the issue of mercury also. We now have, in a few weeks' time, a diplomatic conference in Minamata, Japan, to agree on a new legal instrument to phase down and hopefully ultimately phase out the use of mercury in our lives. And it is another example of how science has brought countries with very different interests, very different challenges, very different thresholds also together. And perhaps it is just for two coincidence, but I'm sure, Carol, it isn't probably with your planning, but today is also the United Nations General Assembly designated day uh, to commemorate the signing of the Montreal Protocol on Substances that deplete the ozone layer. If anything, here is a treaty, here is an example of nations coming together on the basis of science, committed also through a financial envelope and an agreed set of targets to move together in phasing out a, substance, a series of substances that perhaps for the first time illustrate to us that we really do depend on one another in keeping this planet functionally alive and also stable. Today we can look back on the history of the Montreal Protocol with 98% of ozone depleting substances agreed at the time phased out. And lo and behold, taking the recent meetings also between China and the United States at the highest level, looking perhaps to this most successful of all environmental treaties as perhaps a partial vehicle that will help us address the challenge of CFCs, HFCs, ozone depleting substances, and our ability to first of all recognize that the Montreal Protocol has even already made a significant contribution towards addressing global warming or at least climate change in the sense of the mix of substances that are in our atmosphere, but more importantly, to allow international cooperation to emerge. Our work on the short-lived climate pollutants is also a fascinating journey <clears throat> of science beginning to recognize certain phenomena. And two days from now, in New York at the American History, Natural History Museum, we will be rewarding and recognizing and awarding this year's Champions of the Earth Awards. Amongst them, and this is the highest recognition the United Nations has for people across the world to provide leadership on environment and sustainability related issues. One of the winners this year will be Professor Ramanathan, who over 10 years ago, 15 years ago already, was at the forefront of recognizing this phenomenon of the atmospheric brown cloud. The fact that black carbon soup particles were beginning to accumulate in a, on a scale over Asia, and as we later discovered also over other parts of the world, that not only had a pollution impact directly, but also had a climate relevant signal. It is only this work, and then the work of many others also, such as Drew Schindel, who led the methane assessment that UNED put out a few years ago, and our work on tropospheric ozone related to that, and the recognition of the rapidly growing potential use of HFCs, which could, if not uh, avoided, account for up to 20% of CO2 equivalent emissions in just a few decades. If we could not address these short-lived climate pollutants, which by their very nature are different from carbon dioxide, which remains the biggest challenge, and we should never allow these two to be traded off against one another. 
But the big difference is that on short-lived climate pollutants, two fascinating things allow the world to come together. First of all, if you stop their emission, you have an almost instant impact. Because short-lived climate pollutants, as their name says, do not linger in the atmosphere for hundreds of years or longer. They are a matter of days, months, perhaps a couple of years, until you begin to be able to see the impact of reducing emissions. So they act, or action translates immediately into impact. Secondly, as so often and often forgotten perhaps in the climate debates of this world, <clears throat> an action taken, for example, in black carbon and soot has perhaps an even more immediate impact just on basic health of literally millions and millions of people. At our recent meeting in Oslo, the World Health Organization estimated that the number of premature deaths alone from pollution, black carbon, soot, indoor and outdoor related pollution, is around 6 million people. Imagine any single action that you could take today that could save 6 million people from premature death. Because it is pollution, because it is so elusive in one sense, because it is sometimes far away, we don't recognize the magnitude, the significance of actions that could be taken. So here we are with science giving us not only an immediate health impact for millions of people, on top of that, we also can take steps that will help us to at least stay within a likely scenario of managing also the global warming potential. You'll hear, hear more from that from my colleagues in a minute. As you have seen with uh, President Obama and President Xi Jinping, if we do indeed move forward on the issue of HFCs and the Montreal Protocol, we could open up a second track in which an existing instrument could immediately begin to deliver with a proven formula joint international efforts to avoid something becoming a major problem before it has gained that magnitude in terms of impact. The benefit of also addressing tropospheric ozone and methane are self-evident to those who look at methane from the point of view of landfills and pollution. But tropospheric ozone long for long had been underestimated in terms of its impact on agricultural production. So yet again, having a kind of co-benefit perspective here will allow you to take action on tropospheric ozone even if climate doesn't interest you at all. Because it has a major direct impact on the agricultural economy and therefore the economies of our nations around the world. And that was the guiding idea that we in the United Nations Environment Program, beginning with my predecessor, saw as the role that we could play in helping emerging science to find a quicker way into the policy arena because the timelines for action today are getting shorter. Our ability to, for instance, act on science that is available in the scientific journals and publications often can take 10, 15 years until it makes its way into the policy arena. One of the roles that we can play in the United Nations and the United Nations Environment Program has, in a sense, taken that role time and again, beginning with such things as the ozone layer, um, the ozone depleting substances, mercury, lead and sulfur and fuels, is to, in a sense, enable countries to come together and act. And this was the driving idea behind the Climate Clean Air Coalition, which began, as I said, just 18 months ago at a launch here in Washington, D.C. at the State Department and has today over 72 members. Over 30 of these are states, and they are states from north and south. They are developing countries and developed countries or economies who normally in some of the international negotiations find themselves on opposite ends of the negotiating table. In this particular context, they have joined forces. And they are approaching these initiatives both from a commitment in joining that coalition to act domestically and to support international initiatives. Today, we have identified 10 high-impact initiatives. I'm sure, Dave, you will speak to them in a moment in more detail. But let me just mention a few where we want to collectively trigger a lot of action, because it is low-hanging fruit with immediate impact and immediate benefit. They include actions on uh, municipal solid waste, on heavy-duty diesel vehicles and engines, on bricks production. Many don't know the role that kills and brick factories in many parts of the world play, for example, on the issue of black carbon. Oil and natural gas production, Senator Church already mentioned those. Agriculture, HFCs, and household cooking and domestic heating. You will hear a little bit more in a moment. The idea behind this coalition is it is not prescribing single actions, but it is essentially bringing a global community of countries and of industry stakeholders, of scientific institutions and institutes into a coalition. 
a coalition that is willing to act right now and that is also offering us an opportunity while the world is struggling to figure out how exactly to deal with, for example, the climate challenge and the negotiations in 2015. And even if the world were to agree in 2015 on a new instrument for addressing global warming and climate change, actions would really not kick in before 2020 under any sort of agreement. In the meantime, we have at least six, seven years in which these actions here could make a significant contribution to human health, to agricultural productivity, to our ability to also manage the pace of global warming, and above all, deliver an international coalition that might actually help us also address the issues of climate change more effectively in an international context. I'm very proud and very pleased to be here in Washington today because I know sometimes the work that we do in the United Nations seems remote from the daily issues and agendas of your electorate or the issues that preoccupy the American public. But you know, one of the roles that we have to play as leaders in our society and the international community is also to help the public understand why sometimes something that a scientist at the Scripps uh, Institute, like Rosa Ramanathan, began to think about 20 years ago, may prove to be a fundamental asset for action to us today. And our role in the United Nations is often to try and provide a, a validation, in a sense, of science from the perspective of a common interest, and to help that science enter into the policy space and there begin to attract governments who commit to action. The Climate Clean Air Coalition, the short that climate pollutant story, is truly a success story of science helping society to understand where there are options to do something rather than to sit back, to be resigned, to be frustrated, or only to lament in the sense of the cost of inaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, are there a couple questions for Mr. Steiner? Okay, if you could identify yourself, please. Go ahead. Thank you, and thanks for taking questions before you go. I appreciate it. My name is Lisa Friedman. I, I work for Climate Wire. Um, both yourself and the senator cast some ifs in front of the possibility of a, of a 2015 treaty. Can you? Tell us how, you know, what, what's your level of optimism and, and maybe if you could be a little more specific about what are some of the ways that the dynamics of the short-lived climate pollutants um, group can, can help further the possibility of a treaty? Well, I think neither to you nor to me is 2015 a day in which you can just sit back and say, well, the world will somehow come to agreement. I think we have many reasons to be concerned. <clears throat> I think concerned because we are still living out the tail end of a financial and economic crisis that has, you know, in many cases taken the capacity of countries to think beyond tomorrow um, out of the political equation. I think also the, you know, debt crisis that many countries have been afflicted by is something that has reduced our capacity to think about investment in transitions. Nevertheless, if um, I were to tell you that, you know, UNEP publishes every year a sustainable energy finance report, we actually have a lot of reasons to believe that the world is moving on responding to the challenge of climate change, but also moving towards clean energy, greater energy independence and security at a pace that perhaps many of us wouldn't have expected even you know, five or 10 years ago. Uh, the year 2012 saw again a total investment in renewables and new infrastructure renewables that actually if you add it together was equivalent or even actually greater than the total combined investments in oil, gas and coal. So that gives you a sense of how the world is beginning to implement in the energy sector a really quite significant transition. And there will be many debates about instruments and costs and so on, but what is quite clear is that we are on the verge of seeing a global uptake of renewable energy technology that was unimaginable even five or 10 years ago. So while we struggle at the negotiating table because of a number of diametrics, um, or let's say asymmetries in terms of interests of who needs to act first, and if they don't act, we will not act, Underneath that, we see an enormous amount of action happening in the economy, in the marketplace, but also at the level of cities, municipalities, and provinces, 
and indeed also at you know in some sectors at, at the nation state level. So my argument would be we only have a, a limited period to recover um, a political momentum for a global treaty. But clearly, 2015 is now a, a date in which the world, I think, will reconvene to figure out how to act collectively and in a fair way with you know, a number of different avenues in which action is possible. Secretary General's decision to call the Climate Leadership Summit in September speaks also to the fact that the political leadership of nations are going to reconvene to try and set the scene for 2015. Um, so I'm not pessimistic, but I think we have no reason to be um, no reason to be assuming that you know a 2015 outcome is an automatic conclusion. And this is where the short of time pollutants provide an interesting antidote to those who think that nothing can be done, because what we've actually seen in these 18 months is an extraordinary interest of countries to do something together on the latest science with immediate impact. And maybe for some, it is actually the health impact that is the more important one, and the climate benefit is a co-benefit. For others, it is climate benefits, and the other things are co-benefits. That is what so often is lost in our debate about what we really want to call the transition towards a greener economy. That actually one domain has multiple benefits in others, and this is sometimes less to do with an environmental benefit, but it can be a health benefit, it can be an agricultural benefit. And I think, if I can just say, we are about to see a new series of reports on the climate science emerging. Climate science will continue to be not an imperfect science, but an imperfect knowledge base, because until we can comprehend the entire complexity of how our planet works, atmosphere, biosphere, chemical reactions, we still have a long way to go. The question is, do we have a sufficient base upon which we can assume that if the climate risks are manageable, if transitions are possible, multiple benefits kick in immediately, then why would we not act now? And in particular also the attraction, as I say, of the short-lived climate pollutants is that here you can literally see a decision to act today with a result tomorrow, which I think will build the confidence also of many actors that this is not an issue on which we are more divided than having a shared interest in the world. And that is why I believe also Secretary of State Clinton at the time and the Obama administration and, and many others, in fact, also from a bipartisan perspective, have looked at short lived climate pollutants as this is science based action with clear economic and social benefits. And if you can demonstrate the value of acting together on this front, then I think we will build confidence in one another in the international system. Thank you. Um, do you have something other questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Estrela, uh, I'm Mahabur Rahman. I'm a Fulbright Huberty Chandra Fulbright Fellow at the University of Maryland. And I'm from Bangladesh, the developing country, you know. And we are uh, one of the most vulnerable countries uh, in climate change. Uh, in our country, uh, we are really experiencing what is climate change, uh, although it is a research topic or interesting topic for developed countries like United States or other. So my question is, uh, uh, what the developed countries did in the past and continue doing like United States and China due to greenhouse gas emission. And we have seen that uh, the conference of parties uh, organized by UN are, it failed, it failed effort. And the world is not reached any, any kind of uh, global uh, negotiation process till now, and although we are hoping. But in the meantime, and the countries which are suffering, what is the plan from UN to, to support them, to rescue them? Because I have seen, I mean, Southern Bangladesh is sinking. Our agricultural production is decreasing day by day. And we really know what is eradicating for. So, I mean, I think what is your opinion? Let me first of all begin by congratulating you on coming from Bangladesh because Bangladesh was one of the seven launch partners of the Climate Clean Air Coalition. Bangladesh is one of the first countries to have a national climate change strategy and a national climate act in place. And Bangladesh government and citizens and scientists and also uh, NGOs have been at the forefront of, in a sense, integrating 
thinking about the consequence of climate change about the future development of the country. But as you point out, the challenges are enormous. The support from the international world has been slow in, in being forthcoming. And some of the decisions that Bangladesh will have to take, for example, in terms of adaptation to climate change, are beyond the imagination of most macroeconomic planners uh, in the world, because the threat, particularly to a country like Bangladesh, has often been described of sea level rise, extreme weather events, and other such consequences. Now, what are we doing as an international community to walk alongside a country like Bangladesh that has actually taken the initiative? And I, I also want to emphasize in this room here that, you know, there is so much more happening out there, also in developing nations and economies, on addressing the issue of lower warming, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, that is often recognized in the capitals of the developed world. Whether it is Brazil's significant reduction in deforestation, whether it is the decision by Indonesia to suspend um, you know, new logging concessions and to try and put a reducing uh, emissions from deforestation degradation system in place, uh, Mexico's Climate Act, Brazil's initiatives also in energy efficiency sectors, the massive investment in China and Indian renewables. And these are all actions that sometimes in the climate negotiation dynamics are actually lost in the international perception. And if you work for the United Nations Environment Program today, you have a reason to be very worried because the pace of everything doesn't add up with the need for a response. But you actually can go into virtually any country on the planet today and see some fascinating policy changes, economic changes happening, and also leadership from the private sector. Our role in UNIF, particularly as part of the UN family, is to help, for example, on the technology front. UNIF now hosts the Climate Technology Center Network, which is meant to be a kind of shortcut for countries to access the latest technology in terms of a low carbon economy, energy efficiency, be it in terms of rural electricity access systems, or be it in terms of solar water heaters for urban centers which can save 30 to 40 percent of the electricity bill and consumption. It is our role also to help the world try and see how adaptation is a practice that is very new for most countries. How do we bring experts together? We today have a global adaptation network in different regions of the world where we bring the experts together. We also try and bring an ecosystem perspective to adaptation, which is critical if we have to achieve multiple benefits. UNIF works on the renewable energy front on the transition towards uh, low carbon mobility systems around the world. So much of what we can offer to countries that are interested is how do we learn from one another? How can we fast track technologies? How do we lower the threshold of introducing more energy efficient technologies? For example, also to make sure that the poor aren't excluded and are part of that solution. And I could tell you about many of the, <coughs> the programs, but these are just a few examples of very practical support, building the capacity, helping national legislation, bringing national policies into place. Um, for instance, in our home country where UNIT is based, Kenya is one of the few developing countries in the world today with a green energy policy. It is massively investing in geothermal, in wind, and soon in photovoltaics, and over 95% of its entire new energy investment, which will double the country's capacity for electricity, are actually renewable energy sources. So it's just a few examples that I hope give you a flavor of how when a country like Bangladesh realizes the threat, takes actions, can then be supported also from the outside. And that's why also global climate finance, public and private and investments will play a critical role in, I think, maybe in 10 years time, allowing you to come back here and say, you know, there was actually a kind of compact at work. At the moment, we are still struggling with that idea. I'm sorry I have to step out right now, but thank you very much for having me. Actually, the real experts, pundits and gurus are to my right, so uh, I hope you all have a very good afternoon with them, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And he even overstayed his time a little bit, so we are very, very appreciative to um, have been joined by UNEF's director, Ahmed Steinem. On the Hill, leadership is very important. And so we're very fortunate to have heard briefly from Senator Murphy. On the House side, 
here is a representative uh, from California, uh, Scott Peters, who, like Senator Murphy, has been very, very concerned uh, and, and very eager to assume leadership in terms of looking at the whole role of short-lived climate pollutants. And while he could not be here today, we are very pleased that his legislative assistant who is working on these issues very closely with him, Lumei Wang, is here, and I'd like to ask her to, if you'd like to make a couple minutes remarks. I'll be really short, um, but thank you all for being here. I'm so glad that Senator Murphy could also be here as well. I know Scott uh, was disappointed that um, the House wasn't in session today, but uh, you know, my name is Lumei Wang, and uh, I'm representing Scott Peters from the 52nd District of California, and that's uh, a lot of coastal and a northern and central part of San Diego. And uh, last year, the city of San Diego did a climate assessment, and they realized that they would be um, incredibly impacted by climate change, by sea level rise, by more extreme weather events, like wildfires. And so Scott Peters, um, in fact, was inspired by an op-ed that Derwood and Dr. Ramanathan wrote in the New York Times to work on shoreline climate pollutants. And so um, he has introduced a piece of legislation, and I hope you all write the number down. It's H.R. 1943, the Super Pollutant Emissions Reduction Act, or the Super Act. And uh, what this bill does is that it establishes a task force to review policies and measures to promote and to, de to develop best practices for the reduction of super pollutants, or short-lived climate pollutants. And specifically, it, it reviews existing and potential policies that promote these reductions in part by identifying and evaluating the programs of the federal government. So the idea being we need to better coordinate what the federal government can do and be more efficient. Um, it also identifies and recommends specific existing programs and activities that are duplicative and that can be consolidated to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. So um, as you all know, the GAO puts out a report every year of um, duplicative or overlapping programs and we know that they're about 15 programs that deal with um, uh, dirty diesel, and so which is a, a major driver of black carbon. And so while we know that some duplication is good, um, perhaps we can find more efficiencies and therefore be more effective. Um, not only does it, the Super Act find uh, overlaps, it also finds gaps, right? So where programs don't exist, and it recommends focused programs and activities to fill such gaps with an emphasis on industry and public-private partnerships, because the federal government can't do this alone. And it compiles, evaluates, and develops best practices for reductions of super pollutants. Um, the Super Act uh, has a, a good group of supporters, including the League of Conservation Voters, the Environmental Working Group, uh, the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and Ceres, a group of uh, investors interested in sustainability. It's got sponsors sponsorship from representatives on the east and west coast, especially districts that will face serious consequences of sea level rise. So I hope that your boss or your organization will consider supporting the Super Act, and please don't hesitate to find me afterwards to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks, Lene. And I want to also just briefly um, uh, mention that Jesse Young, who is the legislative assistant to Senator Murphy, is also here. And, and of course, Senator Murphy has introduced legislation there. So did you want to add anything? Sure, yeah, I'll be, I'll be similarly brief. Um, when, uh, when Carol was introducing Mr. Steiner, and she said he used to front the uh, International Commission on Dance, I thought she momentarily said the International Commission on Dance. <laughs> Very eclectic guy. <laughs> <laughs> the Renaissance man, entirely possible. Um, <laughs> my name is Jesse. I work for Greg, the guy who opened up the briefing. Um, and has taken a big interest in this issue along with uh, Lume's boss. Um, since we have a huge subject matter experts here, I won't pretend to go into the substance of the issue here, just to make a pitch on the political side. As Chris said, um, you know, we're largely talking to, um, I think, friends here, but we really need on the Hill, we need Republicans. We need folks on the other side of the aisle who care about this. As Mr. Steiner said, you can make an argument for action on short-lived climate pollutants that doesn't even mention the word climate. Um, we here in the United States are in a position of authority to share a lot of sort of groundbreaking technology we've done, whether it's on methane wellhead containment, uh, green completions, HFC alternatives that are produced by some leading American corporations. We're in a position to export our knowledge around the world and achieve really exponential benefits in agricultural production and public health 
you have some folks like Susan Collins, Senator Susan Collins, who's about to reintroduce her clean cook stoves bill over here, primarily making the argument as a uh, question of public health, not even getting into black carbon's effect on the Tibetan plateau, snow melt, and things like that. So as you talk to offices and as you talk to other organizations, I hope you'll help make the pitch, because we could have every Democrat in the Senate and every Democrat in the House of Representatives co-sponsoring great legislation on this front, and we will get nowhere. Um, you know, regardless of what happens, as Chris said, with the UNFCCC, we can make real progress right now, whether it's getting China to actually lay out a schedule for forming a contact group, getting India to start drawing down something under the Montreal Protocol. We can do real work right now, but if we don't have folks here domestically they are supporting those efforts, the administration can only do so much, and Dave and John and the folks at State are doing a tremendous job, but here on the Hill, we want to make sure we have the political support for them to make this mainstream. Because if we're just talking to ourselves, it's just that, we're just talking to ourselves. So, thank you guys for coming, and um, Looking forward to the rest of the presentations. Thanks, Jesse. We will next hear from David Turk, who is counselor to the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change at the U.S. State Department. He is also the U.S. representative to the working group of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And you heard Mr. Steiner talk about that important coalition and the fact that there are now more uh, 34 um, governments that, that are involved in this uh, important international effort. Uh, Dave has previously served as a special assistant to the president and as a deputy assistant secretary at the State Department. He also was on the Hill for eight years on both the Senate and the House side. So he brings a wealth of experience in terms of working in both the uh, legislative as well as the executive branch side um, on this important issue. And he has a travel schedule that just won't stop, <laughs> as we know from trying to schedule this. David, go ahead. you want to come to the podium? Sure, that'd be great. No, thank you, Carol. Thanks for having me here today. Um, it's a privilege to be with such a distinguished panel. It's a privilege to um, speak after Occam Steiner. Um, there's a good and bad about that. The uh, bad is that he's so eloquent, anybody else sounds really uh, like they're butchering the English language. <laughs> Um, the good part is um, he laid everything out very eloquently, and so I'm going to keep my remarks short so we have plenty of time for, uh, for Q&A. Jesse and Lume, it's terrific to be here with you. Your bosses uh, have shown such great leadership, and, and you two personally have been such champions on this issue. It's, it's terrific to work um, with both of you and, and your bosses as well. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short, and I'll focus on two main questions. Um, the first one is why focus on short-lived climate pollutants? And then I'll give, um, a, secondly, an update of some of the things we're doing um, internationally from the State Department side, but on behalf of the U.S. government to advance the cause on, on short-lived climate pollutants, primarily through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, but there's some other related efforts as well. I'll just give a, a brief update and then be happy to answer any and all questions. So I think Occam and, and LeMay and, and, and Jesse and, and Senator Murphy laid out a pretty compelling case for why to work on short-lived climate pollutants, and in fact, the, the better question would probably be why not work on short-lived climate pollutants. Um, I think the arguments for doing so and being aggressive in this action, to, to me, come down into two, two buckets, if you will. One is it's a very pragmatic area to make progress in. Um, Secretary Clinton was always fond of saying, launching this coalition, that you've got real-world technologies already existing out there to deal with some of the, the issues, whether it's methane, black carbon, HFCs, and you have real-world actors out there. And so all you need to do is take an analysis of different sectors, figure out where we're at, what are the obstacles, and how to overcome that. And what you find when you do that analysis, and UNEP has done some terrific analysis, others have done some terrific analysis, is there's relatively modest obstacles to overcome. Some are a little more challenging than others. Some are finance-related, some are political will. Um, but it's a doable proposition. You actually can make real-world progress in some of these areas. And I think that's something that's very attractive to those of us um, who want to spend their lives actually advancing causes, making progress. Um, that's why most of you are probably working on the Hill, recalling my, hill, my days on the, on the Hill way back when we did not have a Capitol Visitor Center and we ended up meeting in really um, not as, not as uh, august environment. 
Um, but that's sort of the pragmatic focus, and I think that's an attraction that a lot of people share on that. The other part is um, it, it's, it's meaningful. You can actually make a meaningful difference working on short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and Occam and some of the other speakers have referenced the fact that it's not just climate, but there's health benefits and agricultural benefits. So if you look at all of those, the climate benefits, the statistics is probably used the most often is if you do aggressive action, the kind outlined in a, a groundbreaking UNEP report, you can achieve up to um, a 0.5 degree Celsius um, reduction in global temperature uh, by 2050. And those of you who follow the climate change discussions, 0.5 degrees is a pretty big deal and a significant uh, part of what we're trying to do overall. This is, of course, to reference um, CO2 is the main ball game. I think everybody should be very clear about that. It's something I know when we speak about the short-lived climate pollutant piece, we always make clear on you're not going to solve the climate challenge that we share by just focusing on short-lived climate pollutants. You need to very much focus on CO2, and uh, the bulk of my efforts, the bulk of our efforts are focused on CO2. Uh, but you can have a meaningful climate, a significant climate benefit by focusing on SLCPs. Um, and there's no reason you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. You can't make progress on CO2. You can't make progress on the short-lived climate pollutant piece. And that's the approach that, that, we, that we very much take to it. Even if you put aside the climate benefits um, altogether, you can get a lot of benefits and frankly be motivated solely from the health benefits or the agriculture productivity benefits. Occam laid out in quite compelling terms some of the health benefits you see, um, some of the black carbon, uh, methane, ozone uh, precursors, et cetera. Um, we had, as Akka mentioned, two weeks ago we were in Norway for a high-level session of our CCAC where ministers came together and our newest partner, one of our newest partner, the World Health Organization was there and laid out in very compelling terms some of the um, health benefits, the millions of lives that you could save, the premature deaths avoided by working on the short-lived climate pollutant piece. So even if you put climate to the side, it still makes sense to work in this space even from just the health side. You also get other multiple benefits. Um, and I prefer the term multiple benefits as opposed to co-benefits because they're all benefits in and of themselves that all stack out, uh, out there. You get some significant agricultural productivity benefits. And frankly, that's one of the reasons I think that a lot of countries have come to the coalition is you can get benefits that are localized, a lot of times to health and agricultural benefits, um, and some of the climate benefits in some sense are global or more regional in nature. And it's really one of those ideally win-win situations that you can have. So again, the question less is why focus on SLCPs, and the question is why wouldn't you focus on SLCPs, and that's the attitude that we certainly take. So assuming you buy that, then what do you do about it, and how do you actually make some um, real-world progress in this area? So we have spent a lot of time at, at the U.S. State Department working with our other interagency colleagues on this climate and clean, clean air coalition. And I should emphasize that this is very much a partnership. It was started as a partnership. We had, as Aka mentioned, seven partners at the founding 18, 19 months ago. Um, countries, both develop, developing, um, and non-state partners as well. At that point, UNEP was the first non-state partner. Flash forward, fast, fast forward now, um, 18, 19 months, we're up to over 70 partners. Um, and that includes develop, developing countries, a lot of the key players out there, not all, and we want to bring on more key players out there in the world to get as much meaningful benefits as we possibly can from this coalition. But we also have other very important, um, powerful institutions out there as part of this partnership. We've got the World Bank, who is an incredibly constructive, active partner in this coalition. We've got UNEP, of course, the WHO, other partners who bring some real meaningful um, um, expertise, political clout, et cetera, a number of um, non-governmental organizations, NGOs as well. We also have instituted a science advisory panel with some of the most eminent scientists, preeminent scientists in the world so that our coalition is guided by the best science. The science is ongoing in these areas, especially if you look at something like black carbon in which there's a new study that seems to come out every day or every week focused on not only the climate benefits, the health benefits, et cetera, and it's very important as a coalition to be guided by the science, to have that as a solid foundation. So we've now got a science advisory panel that's up and running and guiding our efforts. We've got um, some significant amounts of funding going into the coalition. At our meeting a couple weeks ago, Norway, um, who was hosting the meeting, put forward another 20 million U.S. dollars into the coalition. That brings us up 
um, into the range of $60 million plus dollars, and it seems to be snowballing, which is um, actually quite useful if you think about some of the challenges faced in this area. And the funding um, that we do through the coalition is less a project-by-project project focus basis. It's more the catalytic funding. It's sometimes you need a little extra fund funding to make the, 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 the plan actually work. So how do we actually do the bulk of our work in the um, CCAC, in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition? It's guided around initiatives. And so what we've done, as Aka mentioned, is basically take a look at the major sectors, do a sophisticated analysis of what would actually get some real world action, get some um, obstacles overcome, and make progress in some of these sectors. So we have an initiative, for instance, focused on heavy duty diesel vehicles because the transportation sector is about one fifth of global black carbon. Heavy duty diesel vehicles are the super emitters in this space. So can we work with local jurisdictions, countries, the private sector to actually reduce the emissions coming from these vehicles? It's a complicated issue. It takes some work. You have to reduce the sulfur content in the fuels in order to be able to get the particle filters on the trucks. But there are ways to do it. There are countries who have gone through this transition. There are lessons to be learned that could be leveraged and utilized for other countries. So we're both targeting specific countries, specific cities in which this transition can be moved along at, at quicker speed, but also working on some global architecture to try to make this um, more possible, more, um, more realistic happening um, as quickly as, 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 as possible. We have an initiative focused on the oil and gas sector, uh, methane and black carbon emissions. On methane, it's the second largest sector next to agriculture in terms of methane emissions. Largely, um, some um, big companies um, who have the means to be able to control their methane emissions. So the challenge there is how do you work with the private sector? How do you get a value proposition that works from them economically, getting some reputational benefits, other kinds of things that will motivate some of these big countries to, or big companies to, to, to make the emission reductions that are possible. Solid waste, um, again, third largest sector in terms of methane. Lots of potential in terms of open agricultural burning on black carbon side. We're working with cities primarily there. They're the main actors who control the landfills and other waste. How can we work with them in a pragmatic way? World Bank's a partner helping with some of the finance pieces. We're leveraging some of the technical expertise in our government and cities like Stockholm to make real world plans within some of these big um, cities out there, especially from some of the emerging, uh, emerging economies. So happy to go into any chapter and verse, and if there's a particular sector that you're mostly interested, chances are we have an initiative. We now have 10 initiatives in this um, coalition trying to, again, make as meaningful and big, pragmatic uh, um, 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 progress as we possibly can. The U.S. is also, of course, um, working on SLCPs beyond the CCAC, beyond the Climate and Clean Air Coalition as well. The President's Climate Action Plan had several references, several um, real-world action-oriented efforts in the short-lived climate space. One of the ones that I, I think will be um, quite meaningful is an interagency task force that is focusing on methane, doing, an inter, doing a thorough interagency scrub to see what more we could be doing, um, doing on, on, on uh, methane emission reductions. And I should say one of the big challenges with short-lived climate pollutants in our government and frankly other governments as well is a lot of this does cut across a number of different agencies. And now having worked in the legislative branch and the executive branch, that interagency coordination problem is one of the biggest obstacles, frankly, that needs to be overcome in, in any of these spaces. So we're trying to work that interagency piece better in our own U.S. government. We've also been very focused on uh, HFCs, um, as Durwood and Mack will get into um, in some length and, and won't take up time in explaining the scientific backing and the impetus for why to work here. We see this as a very fruitful area to make real world immediate progress that has huge climate implications, climate benefits. Um, the statistic um, that's thrown out there is if you follow the current growth rates in HFCs, small portion now of the overall GHG package or portfolio, if you will, for the world, but it's at a growth rate to become 20% of CO2 emissions by 2050, which if you think about it, 20% of CO2, like that's a big deal. So. We're trying to uh, nip that in the bud as much as possible. HFCs are these chemicals. They're sort of super greenhouse gas um, emitters. Can we work with other key countries to make um, um, reductions to have a practical um, um, plan that reduces these in a way that works for all countries involved? To us, the most obvious way to do this is through the Montreal Protocol. It has a tried and true system for dealing with these things. And I suspect Mac and Derwood will get into that a little bit more. 
So we've been trying to work with some of the other key countries, and you, you've likely seen some statements come out, joint statements between our president and president from China. The G20 recently put out a statement, and we're trying to use all angles um, as we possibly can to make progress in that area as well. So that's um, it for my presentation, but certainly happy to answer questions at the tail end of this as well. But thanks again for having me here. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And as David said, it, it takes a lot of different kinds of partners coming from multiple kinds of uh, organizations and whether it's governments at the, the local level, state, um, uh, international, and also the private sector in terms of looking at how these things all work together and how we both solve problems and also create um, many multiple benefits at the same time. And so to talk a little bit more about that, we are very glad to be joined by someone who has been deeply engaged in this for many, many years. And that is Dr. Mac McFarland, who is the Global Environmental Manager with DuPont Fluorochemicals. Dr. McFarland joined the DuPont company in 1983 and where his primary responsibilities have been in the areas of coordinating research programs and the assessment and interpretation of scientific information on, stratos uh, on stratospheric ozone depletion and global climate change. So he has, as a result, participated in nearly all of the major international scientific assessments of stratospheric ozone under the Montreal Protocol and uh, with regard to global climate change in terms of the uh, uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as an author, reviewer, or review editor. To let you know how valuable his, his uh, scholarly uh, uh, background has been in his advice and his research capabilities, I want to point out that during 1995 and 96, Dr. McFarland was on loan to the Atmosphere Unit of the UN Environment Program. And then in 1997, he was on loan to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group to um, it, its Technical Support Unit. And I think one of the things that is important to recognize in terms of, again, thinking about how it is so important not only to be able to do the research, to be able to interpret it and to understand it and to figure out what does it really mean and what does it tell us and what do we do with this. But I think that the value is also um, uh, represented by understanding that, that Mac was awarded an individual climate protection award by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for his contribution in providing understandable, reliable information to decision makers. Now, folks, it doesn't get better than that. Mac? <laughs> that's, that's right. So our expectations are already very high, Mac, uh -huh. right? Thank you. I hope I don't disappoint. Uh, looks like I'm the only one that has charts. Uh, you're seeing my scientific roots come out. Uh, so please bear with me as I go through these. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to focus strictly on HFCs. So what are HFCs? They're part of a broader class of compounds known as fluorochemicals that, are, that serve in equipment and products that have high societal value, primarily refrigeration and air conditioning, but also things like the propellants for meter dose inhalers, asthma sprays. Their value proposition is primarily safety. But they can't just be safe. They've got to be uh, efficient in how they're used and uh, be compatible with the equipment in which they're used, refrigeration, air conditioning equipment, whatever else. And because of these properties, they serve these functions in a cost-effective way. However, CFCs and HCFCs that are being phased out under the Montreal Protocol are both ozone depleters and global climate warmers. HFCs, the compounds that are now replacing those to some extent, contribute to climate change. Next chart, please. In this chart, you see the transition that has occurred from 1970 to 2015. And this is actually tons of, thousands of tons of the chemicals 
that have been used, or estimates over the time period. And at the bottom, you see how they've been used. The ozone depletion theory was published in 1974, and at that time, most of the use was as a propellant in personal care products. Over the time, you can see that there has been, if you look at the growth, it would have been off the chart, both from 74 and then from 89, continued growth. But you see that there's been a change in the both the, the magnitudes of use and in how they're used from refrigerants being about 25% here to projected to be about 75% by the time you get to 2015. CFCs have been phased out globally under the Montreal Protocol. HCFCs, which are lesser ozone depleting compounds, were viewed as transition compounds to allow the rapid phase out of CFCs. And then now we're transitioning to HFCs. Again, when the, the theory was first published in 74, there were some actions by some countries and voluntary actions, and you see that the growth stopped, but it wasn't until you had the comprehensive international agreement, the Montreal Protocol, that you really solved the problem where it was comprehensive in terms of being global in nature and addressing all of the compounds. Next chart, please. Now, the Montreal Protocol was designed to protect ozone Point is, it also had a tremendous climate benefit. If you weight these compounds by their global warming potential, so that you get uh, billions of tons of CO2 equivalent here on the vertical axis, and you look at this growth curve from the time the Montreal Protocol was signed, and you extrapolate it out, and then look where we were in 2010, you got about five to six times the Kyoto target. In other words, the Kyoto target would have reduced global greenhouse gas emissions by about 2 billion tons CO2 equivalent in 2010. The Montreal Protocol did about 11 billion tons. The issue is the growth going forward. If we don't do anything about HFCs, they could eventually become a significant contributor, wiping out much of the gain that we had with the original Montreal Protocol by eliminating CFCs. And you've heard twice now about HFCs by 2050 could be 20% of CO2. If we're going to reach the target that most countries have acknowledged, 450 parts per million CO2 um, concentration to a limit global uh, average temperature increased by, to no more than two degrees, that's where you have to be. This is the 20% that people are talking about where HFCs could be a significant fraction of that. Next chart, please. And I'm going through these fairly fast, uh, but you have them in your uh, uh, packet, I believe. They were distributed outside. Uh, so the question is, how uh, valid are those projections or scenarios? Well, from atmospheric measurements of these gases, you can deduce the emissions into the atmosphere. And that's what we see here from data from the NOAA labs here, where these are measurements of 134A, weighted again in uh, millions of tons of CO2 equivalent on the vertical scale, and then the sum of all of the major HFCs here, where the circles are the measurements, the solid lines are the projections from this paper that I just showed in the previous. And you can see that they track very well. The question is what's going to happen here in 2013, and I'll get to in a minute why 2013 is a, an inflection point here. Another thing you can tell is by looking at the distribution of these gases, which ones were being measured individually, you can deduce that about a third of the, of the total in CO2 equivalents is coming from mobile air conditioning, about a third from commercial refrigeration, supermarkets, and about a third from everything else, all the other uses of HFCs today. Next chart, please. So, why was 2013 so significant? Well, it's because this year the developing countries have frozen their use of HCFCs and are beginning their transition to phase out HCFCs. Developed countries like the United States are well on their way to phasing out HCFCs. In large part, primarily in refrigeration and air conditioning, HFCs have been the compounds of note to replace the HCFCs. Also, developing countries are rapidly um, expanding their economies and their standard of living. As they do that, they want more refrigeration, more access to air conditioning. With all of that, 
you can project a significant growth. So here is the developing country projected growth rate out to 2050. Here's the developed country. So to really address this issue, we truly need a global agreement to prevent the growth. And like some of the other short-lived or the other short-lived climate pollutants, this is a case of preventing growth rather than eliminating them in the atmosphere now. Um, next chart, please. So what would be the impact of, a, of implementing something like the North American Proposed Amendment to the Montreal Protocol? Well, in this paper that you see referenced down here, we ran a scenario of a control system that was not that far from uh, what is in the North American proposal. And if you look at the cumulative amount of emissions that you could avoid, or consumption you could avoid between now and 2050. It's about 100 billion tons CO2 equivalent, which is over 15 times the total greenhouse gas emissions from the United States in 2011, the last year in which it was reported. Next chart, please. So what can you do about it? Well, when you look at these things I said, as I said before, are used primarily because of their safety characteristics and their desirable properties. So when you're looking for alternatives, you've got to look for things that are safe. You've got to look for sustainability, which means zero ODP and low GWP. They've got to be energy efficient, have the right chemical, perform, uh, chemical properties, and they've got to be cost effective to use. Uh, if, and on the safety issue, you've either got to find other compounds that are safe or you've got to mitigate the safety problems with, for example, hydrocarbons that are highly flammable. Um, the next chart, in the, then the last thing here is the timing of commercial availability. So the question is, do we have the ability to meet what uh, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico have proposed in the North American proposed amendment? Next chart. This shows what we're doing at DuPont to address this, where if you look at the sectors where these HFCs are primarily used, we're looking at a wide and the current compounds that are used, the GWP of those compounds, and then the options that we're exploring. It's primarily based on a new class of fluorochemicals called HFOs that have the common the, the, the desirable characteristic of HFCs, but they have a chemical property that means they don't last very long once in the atmosphere, which significantly lowers their ability to contribute to climate change. So you're seeing a reduction of over 99%, in some cases less, but a very significant reduction in the uh, ability of these compounds that could replace HFCs to affect climate. If you go to the next chart, looking more broadly, there are multiple options from multiple companies. So there are a wide range of options that are either in uh, late development stages, ready now, or will be ready very soon. And again, some of them are based, based on these new, this new class of HFOs. Some of them are uh, CO2, hydrocarbons, are blends of these things. And again, you get very significant reduction in terms of their ability to contribute to climate change. Next chart, please. About two months ago, two and a half months ago, EPA uh, issued a report with analysis of could the United States meet the North American proposal? And they looked at the business as usual forecast of the demand for HFCs, then the North American cap proposal is here shown in blue. So that was, is what the United States would have to meet. Their analysis indicated that you could meet this green line. So in this analysis, it's met all the way out to 2035. You know, that's over 20 years in the future. And then you almost meet it going beyond. These bars in between show the different sectors and how you would meet it. Well. We have done the analysis only out to 2030, and we agree with the EPA that you can exceed the North American proposal in terms of reduction. So we're at a line that would be at or below the green line that EPA is showing here. 
and there's lots of time to develop the uh, what would be needed to meet it all the way out to 2050. Next chart. So in conclusion, the scientific case for doing something about this issue is compelling. The, and the amendment, if adopted as proposed, could have the effect of, between now and 2050, eliminating emissions that would contribute to climate as much as 15 times the current total greenhouse gas emissions from the United States, a very significant impact. There are options out there that would allow the U.S. and other countries to meet uh, this uh, schedule. And finally, DuPont supports the North American Amendment, and why? One, the science is compelling, the options are out there, and importantly, the Montreal Protocol is a 25-year-old working agreement that industry has been working under all this time. We're comfortable with it. We know how to operate under it. It's both all the affected industry. And very, very important, something is being done about this issue. It's being done at the country or regional level. And we're seeing a patchwork of regulations right now. You have a carbon tax in Australia. You've got bans or GWP limits in Europe. You've got Japan developing something else. It is very difficult when you've got products, both in terms of these chemicals and in the equipment they use that are traded globally. It is very difficult for business planning under certain situation. So we need a form of agreement that it provides a basis for consistent national regulations, is flexible with a to allow a seamless transition with a predictable timetable, and that is flexible and market-based. It doesn't require you to ban certain uses or have a GWP limit, but allows industry to choose where it can most cost-effectively meet it. So in conclusion, we've got an agreement out there. It's worked for 25 years. We're looking at the same uh, class of compounds, the same applications, and uh, we believe that uh, the world can continue to achieve these environmental gains under a Montreal Protocol. Okay, Mac, I think you delivered, right? <laughs> so for our last speaker, we've asked uh, Derwood Zalke, who is the founder and president of the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, which has offices here in Washington, D.C., as well as in Geneva. That's Derwood, because he has really been up to his eyeballs in in focusing on sh re how to best reduce short-lived climate pollutants in a whole variety of venues and to do it in a way to complement the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, including uh, the Montreal Protocol. And he's also been heavily engaged with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, that was organized um, and launched uh, 18 months ago. And so as a result of all of this work that Derwood has been doing in terms of being very closely involved with um, these, uh, both the, the climate negotiations as well as um, looking at short-lived climate pollutants, we've, and, and looking at environmental compliance and enforcement, he's um, uh, a secretariat for a network of compliance officers that involves over 5,000 enforcement and compliance officials from different countries. So he brings a very special eye to, uh, to these issues that we're hearing discussed. So we've asked him to be kind of a respondent to what we have heard today. Derwood? Thank you, Carol. Uh, and thank you for the role of wrapping up. This is a fantastic group. I mean, you really got the A team here. And uh, I will try to try to put some emphasis on what you have heard. There are two key packages of benefits that we uh, have had presented. The first one is near-term mitigation through multiple venues using existing technologies and existing laws and institutions in most cases that can deliver something profound for the world. We can cut 
the rate of climate change in half by taking out the short-lived climate pollutants. In half. We have a big, serious problem. If we cut it in half, we have half the problem. That's a damn good target for us. We can cut the short-lived climate pollutants by, and cut warming in the Arctic by two-thirds. Okay, and the Arctic is a flashpoint. I mean, this is the defensive shield that's sending a lot of heat back into space with the big white ice. We lose that. We lose that shield, and we get the positive feedback that accelerates warming, liberates uh, methane and CO2 from permafrost and from methane hydrates, and we risk going into runaway feedback that we're not going to restabilize that until, until Bangladesh is gone. OK? Sorry. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a pretty serious thing. But we can cut the problem in half. I mean, that's, I think this is just brilliant for us to think of, of the challenge that we have. And it's, again, existing technologies, existing laws and institutions. And uh, the best one to, to use to illustrate is the Montreal Protocol. Max set this out. I mean, this treaty has done 10 times more climate mitigation than the UNFCCC. I mean, this poor cousin of ours is struggling to learn how to do serious climate mitigation. And for 25 years, Montreal Protocol has blasted ahead, solving the first great threat to the global environment, the atmosphere, of uh, the uh, stratospheric ozone layer. We have basically solved that problem and put the stratospheric ozone layer on the path to recovery by mid-2065, uh, 20, maybe. So it takes a while for the system to catch up. And we've made this huge contribution to climate protection already. Now we have the chance to do the next huge piece, which is to take out the HFCs while they're still tiny. They're 1% to 2% of climate forcing right now. It's really small. But they are the fastest growing greenhouse gas in the United States, in China, in India. And they're going to be 20% of business as usual CO2. But even more telling, I think, they could be 40 to 45% of the CO2 curve if we bend it down to the 450 level that we need to bend it to. So here's where we're going with CO2. We need to bend in here. And here's where you're going. I don't have my charts here. So here's where you're going with the HFCs. You know, and we're going to be a big percentage if we succeed with the CO2, which we must. So we're going to make it twice as hard on the world if we don't take out the, the um, HFCs right now. Montreal Protocol allows us to do something that is big, fast, cheap. How big is it? It can avoid just the HFC piece can avoid up to 0.5 degrees in warming by the end of the century. By 2050, it can avoid up to 100 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So this is, these are really big numbers. You can do it fast because the treaty knows its business. And it can do it very cheaply. Okay? It's probably going to be about 5 cents a ton of CO2 equivalent. Okay? That's pretty amazing. OK. Now, the, so we should take this challenge on. You know, it's, it's half of climate change. The other uh, half of the solution. The other thing that we've heard and I want to elaborate a little more on is what the success with short-lived climate pollutants can do for, first I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Ambassador uh, Stereo Takesi from the Federated States of Micronesia. Stereo was a uh, first country to propose using the Montreal Protocol to phase down HFCs. And even before that, in 2006 and 2007, you were the first country to say, let's also accelerate the phase down of HCFCs for climate purposes. So we owe a, a great debt to the Federated States of Micronesia for helping point the world in this direction. So the other thing that we're getting from the success with short-lived climate pollutants is, um, is a change in global climate policy. 
So over here you have the UNFCCC that is struggling. And it's, it's basically a system that's about reparations, who's the bad guy, who's going to have to pay the most. And uh, it's run by dementors, OK? I mean, people who, who have very little hope of saving the world. And they're in this bad loop over here. We, on the side of short-lived climate pollutants, are the ones with hope and optimism. I mean, this is really important. And we're pioneering something that is now being recognized and given a, a new name called ICIs, International Complementary Initiatives or International Cooperative Initiatives, to help the UNFCCC, to complement the UNFCCC. They need to be complemented, and uh, they need some help over there. So this is a, a broader package of venues, a distributed package, not the, the monopoly that the UNFCCC has had in the past, but a recognition that we've got a lot of ways we can help solve climate change. Montreal Protocol, uh, ICAO for air emissions, IMO for shipping, the CCAC, great initiative. And the, the CCAC, one thing I love about it is it's all about optimism. You go to the meetings that I did with Dave in Oslo, everybody there has a great time because they're making progress solving problems. So it's, it, it will change the broader climate uh, game by bringing in our success and our optimism. And, um, and, and we need to do it very quickly. Uh, success does breed success. Now, one, one more point, and I'll, I'll end. And that is that we need not only to be bringing this to the world, as the State Department and EPA have done so well, and the president. This is on the president's top agenda. He, when he was negotiating with President Xi in Sunnyland in June, he came away with two agreements, North Korea, Let's work together on North Korea. And the other is, let's work together on climate change on uh, Montreal Protocol in particular. He goes to the G20 last week, and he's facing Syria. I mean, this is a, this is a big issue. And still managed to negotiate a successful agreement on the Montreal Protocol and HFC. So, and then a separate side agreement with uh, China president as well. So, so this is really important, uh, keeping this at the leader level. But for the US, we have to demonstrate that we're not only telling the world how they should be doing climate, but we need to do it at home. And so the task force that Dave mentioned, the legislation that we heard from Senator Murphy and, uh, and from Lou May for Congressman Peters, these are really important steps. We must continue to show the world that this is not a bait and switch strategy. This is what we can do, and we will continue to do it at home, we'll continue to succeed, and we will share our good practices with the world so that we'll all ultimately solve climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so if anyone has a question, if you could just identify yourself, please. OK, let's start clear in the back, and then we'll come up here. Okay. I'm John Fitzgerald. Um, the question I have, actually, I have a couple of questions for uh, David Turk. Uh, the first is um, whether you can comment on the possibility of using Section 115 of the Clean Air Act which allows the Secretary of State to sign bilateral or multilateral agreements on reducing air pollution with other countries. Um, number two is we have a series of agencies that might offer help to countries that want to make the transition to cleaner refrigerants, whether they be ammonia, whether they be the more advanced HFOs, or whether they be various other technologies, um, like Exim, Export Import Bank, OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Millennium Challenge Corporation, USAID. Question is, why are they not already out there leading that progress? And so I'll leave it at those two. Thanks. No, thanks. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, our, our 
pragmatic focus applies not only in the short-lived space but beyond that. And so to answer your second question first, we very much work with the full interagency, and the State Department plays a coordinating role with the interagency, whether it's Department of Energy, EPA, um, XM, OPIC, um, et cetera, USAID certainly, to try to leverage that interagency expertise across the range of um, across the range of uh, challenges that we have on climate change on the CO2 front and on the short-lived climate space. So, for instance, we've got some work that we announced um, in far as our U.S.-China um, climate change working group in which we're trying to leverage some of that expertise to um, help reduce some emissions in China. We're doing a similar exercise with India. We're doing a similar exercise with a lot of the key players on, on there. So your point in terms of leveraging those the, that expertise um, in the HFC context in particular is a good one, and um, we'll certainly, f we'll certainly um, look to do even more of what we're already doing on there. Um, first question on Section 115, just don't have anything to say, um, to say on that at this point. Okay. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention, too, that if anyone has any questions uh, with reg uh, to UNEP, um, Hillary French from UNEP is here, and so she is also available for um, if you have any particular questions. Okay, um, go ahead. Thanks for letting me have a second question and thanks for doing this, this was really helpful. Um, a, a question on, on the Clean Air Coalition, Climate and Clean Air Coalition again for, for David. Um, and that is about targets and I'm wondering if there are any or if there's going to be any. any I, I recognize this is a different animal than UNFCCC and nobody, you know, it's voluntary coalition, but um, how do you measure what you've done and how do you know if you are successful or not? No, thanks. Great question. And I think our lodestar for this coalition is um, meaningful real world reductions. So the success or failure of the coalition won't be the number of countries that are on board, the number of organizations that are on board, but what are we actually achieving out in the real world? Can we show demonstrable progress that um, happens from our various initiatives and other efforts along those lines? We're 19 months in, so as you suspect, we have not um, sh shrunk short-lived climate pollutants by half at this point. We're um, starting to get some things up and running. Some initiatives are further along than other initiatives are. Each initiative is very different depending on the sector. And so some are focused on cities, some are focused on the private sector, some are focused on sharing experiences among countries as well. And a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the sp particular sectors and approaches are less project by project by project. When you have a particular project and you have some reduction there, you can actually measure it and you can know we reduced X tons of CO2 equivalent, et cetera. When you're focusing on changing policies um, at a national level or getting cities to do something or getting the private sector to do something, you can understand that that may be a little bit more challenging in terms of directly attributing our actions to specific X, Y, and Z reductions. Um, so I'd say a couple things on your particular question. One, I think we very much have in mind, as I said, we'll be judged on the success or failure of what emissions we actually reduce. And so it's in our own interest as a climate and clean air coalition um, for all the reasons we've talked about the whole day to show that we've had some meaningful impact. And we're trying to work through right now, again, depending on which initiative and which sector, how do we actually show the benefits? How do we actually, in a fair way, attribute benefits from our, from our actions? And lots of ongoing discussions about there about that. Your question specifically on targets, goals, et, et cetera. Again, I think we have had some internal discussions in the coalition. We'll have more discussions. Um, I think targets, goals um, can be tools to achieve significant emission reductions. They're not in and of themselves the ends. They're a tool to get you um, the, the, the shared goal that everyone shares of seeing actual redu re reduction real world emissions out there. In some sectors, it may make sense to do that, and we may be able to do that. In other sectors, that's not the model that's going to get, that's not the theory of change that's going to get you the emission reductions you're going to get for whatever reason. Maybe it's country sensitivities, maybe it's company sensitivities, et cetera. So still a work in progress about what, what, um, what effort or what role the targets and goals will be part of the, part of the equation. But again, it's all focused on the lodestar of achieving meaningful, significant real-world reductions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we'll take a question over here, and then I also go go ahead, and then I'll come back to you. 
Hi, my name is Josh Silverman. I'm with the DOE. Um, uh, you talk a lot. It's all about, and I love the uh, approach, but it's all about substitution. And are you looking at greater efficiencies with the systems already in place as they're going to continue through their lifespans? Um, answer is absolutely yes. Whatever you do, clearly the, the energy efficiency standards in most countries are separate from the, uh, the regulations that would control these uh, greenhouse gases. So you must have um, solutions that are as energy efficient or even more so and meet uh, the existing energy efficiency regulations and will be able to continue to meet ever more stringent energy efficiency regulations going forward. But that's a very important point um, because, you know, let's take an extreme example. Your home refrigerator freezer, it has HFC 134A in it. It has about half a pound in it. If you look at the lifetime contribution to climate change from that refrigerator freezer, even if the 134A is emitted to the atmosphere, the HFC, over 99% comes from energy usage from our U.S. mix of, of energy. So your point is a very important one that we must keep energy efficiency in mind. And I had that on a chart, but I just didn't have time to emphasize it. Uh, let me make a further comment about that. Um, in the past phase-outs under the Montreal Protocol, they were phase-outs um, phase at that point, we have catalyzed improvements in energy efficiency in the range of 30 to 60 percent. So we, we expect that the HFC amendment will have that same effect and will catalyze further improvements. But we do need to pay very close attention to it because it is most of the climate impact. And in developing countries. And, and in throughout the world. Sorry, I actually wasn't particularly uh, uh, clear in my question, and thank you for the answers, and that's wonderful. I'm actually curious more about fugitive emissions from the pressurized gas in the systems themselves, so that as we're operating, say, a commercial size uh, or industrial size chiller uh, and losing gas from that system, you know, I'm really uh, curious about improvements in minimizing fugitive emissions as part of this process. Uh, I'll also big supporter, of course, of the improved efficiency. Well. well, that's the equipment manufacturers, and they are working on that. The issue you have is there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of technicians around the world, and how do you control those? And, you know, it is clearly an issue of training of those technicians, and industry is working on it um, as best you can. And there are regulations against vending in the United States, as you know, but um, again, Ultimately, these things are going to get to the atmosphere. You can, you can minimize the amount, but ultimately they do get there. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask the ambassador if he wanted to say something, um, since you've played such an important leadership role. And, um, and obviously, countries like Micronesia are looking at things in a very, very serious, serious way. I thank you very much. Before I do ask the question and the comments, I do want to thank uh, EESI for convening this very important um, meeting. I was very excited about Derwood's comments about half and two-thirds. For us in Micronesia, it's existential. Much of our land is already disappearing. And if we continue to do business as usual, we will be history by maybe 2050. That cannot be. The talks today gives me a lot of hope and encouragement. I would like to ask the folks from CCAC that we need to do a better job in selling by demonstration to the small countries. Uh, to those of you that have CNN and other media, you know, information is easy enough. But for us in the Pacific, where there is very little media coverage, CCAC is, is unknown. Otherwise, we would have been lining up, you know, at the door to sign up. But there is lack of information. 
demonstration that this is serious. It seems to some of us that this is just another ploy to sort of divert attention from bad you know, performance at the UNF uh, C, which they would say hasn't gone very far. But this is positive, and we would like to ask you to please support our amendments at the Montreal Protocol Amendment, and that is to face down HFCs, because that will save my island. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is pretty incredible when you think about the outsized impact that short-lived climate pollutants have with regard to climate and therefore addressing them will also have an outsized impact. And at the same time as you've also heard from all of the speakers, we are finding multiple, multiple benefits that make sense for so many reasons to address so many other problems at the same time. And so I think that this is a very, very important opportunity. It's an exciting opportunity to problem solve, to improve uh, so many things for so many people. And, and in the case of so many places, it's survival. So I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today, this really, really important issue. There are so many things that I think are so exciting to learn about. Um, as we've heard, there is a lot of good news. There are things that can be done that can make a big difference. And so we are hoping to be able to tell more of those stories in terms of looking at other things that are important to address and what makes sense, how we address those pragmatically. And if you've got questions, you know, information from the briefing will be posted up on EESI's website. And also please um, let us know so that we can uh, ask our speakers in terms of follow-up information that you may want. And, um, and if you want, I think that they probably would be happy to take additional questions. But we want to thank everyone for being here today. And I really want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you.